Amen. An American missionary in Africa wanted to translate the English word faith into the local dialect. He could not find its equivalent. So he went to an old sage who was himself a fine Christian for help in rendering the needed word into understandable language. Elder studied it and finally said, does this not mean to hear with the heart? Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and take them to heart. By the patience and comfort of your holy word, we might embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Well, let's recap what uh, we just heard a few moments ago. John chapter 1, beginning at verse 19, is constructed as a series of four days, separated by a thrice repeated phrase on the next day. You find that in John 129, 135, and 143. The four days, therefore, are the following. A one is John 1, 19 through 28. A two, John 1, 29 through 34. Day three, John 1, 35 through 42. And day four, John 1, 43 through 51. And this sequence continues with the mention of on the third day in John 2, verse 1. And counted inclusively, this refers to basically the day after tomorrow. And since the previous day was the fourth day, the miracle at Cana took place on the sixth day. Now, if you read the Gospel of John, you'll notice there's a lot of, if you will, a lot of echoes of Genesis in there. And so, by reference, the sixth day of Jesus' work would coincide with the sixth day of God's finishing his work of creation and entering his work of preservation. Amen? So, on the sixth day after Jesus returns from 40 days of battling the devil in the wilderness, a wedding takes place in Cana of Galilee, not too far from Jesus' hometown of Nazareth. In fact, uh, most of the sources I looked up had it between three miles and 10 miles from Nazareth. Our text tells us that Mary was there and that Jesus and his disciples were invited. At this point, we're given the name of four of them. There was, according to John's gospel, five men, two of John the Baptist's disciples, one not named, the other one Andrew, the brother of Simon Bar-Jonah. Simon himself, whom Andrew went and told about Jesus. Uh, Philip, a fellow resident of Bethsaida with Peter and Andrew. And Nathaniel, a gentleman whom Philip went and told that we found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets wrote, Jesus the Messiah. Now, in those days, a wedding did not celebrate the marriage of two individuals. It actually celebrated the joining together of two families. Wedding celebrations were of immense significance as public demonstrations of family honor and families often went deep in debt, like they often do today outdo each other in the honorific competition to provide the best wedding the village had ever seen. Because a wedding celebration would often include a, the entire village, arrangements were usually quite elaborate and could take many days to prepare. These things haven't changed all that much, unless you go down to Vegas. The family often required a lot of assistance from neighbors and friends in the preparation of food and drink. Usually, each household would have one stone water jar for purification purposes. So the presence of six would indicate that there were at least six families involved in planning this wedding. 
Now, because those five guys I mentioned earlier were Jesus' disciples, he was responsible for them. Uh, just to confirm that and hear more about that, uh, I looked up more information in the Yale Anchor Bible Dictionary. It says discipleship means entering into a lifelong relationship with Jesus. This includes the participation in the uncertain life of a traveling preacher and, and also the suffering and death of that teacher. The disciple is not there merely to learn. He's not just a student, goes, takes notes, and goes home. He's there to share the entire life experience of his rabbi. Everything the rabbi says or does can be teachable material. And so he absorbs it like a sponge. Now together, they're invited to go to the wedding. But it does seem like a spur of the moment decision. And perhaps this is the basis for the moment when Mary tells Jesus about the wine dilemma. Jesus, for some reason, seems to challenge her. Verse 4, Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour is not yet come. Now, one of the things about it, though, the Greek actually includes Mary in this thing. It literally says, what does this have to do with me and you, woman? I don't know why they leave her out of it in most English translations. But it sounds like he was really trying to tell her, why are you taking ownership of this problem? Not your wedding. But nevertheless, well... Mary had her reasons. You see, to run out of food or wine at a wedding involved a serious loss of honor. It signaled not only a lack of financial resources, but even more, a lack of friends. Imagine the father of the bride who has to sit there upon the discovery that his new son-in-law couldn't even afford to keep up some Mogan David we're not talking about, you know, the expensive stuff. Just some plain old ordinary $5 off the shelf. Couldn't even have enough of that. Keep everybody happy. But you know, another thing about it, Jesus had established a pattern in life, one that we can actually see in Luke's gospel in the second chapter when he and his family went to... Uh, the temple to celebrate the Passover. I'm not going to read it to you, but suffice it that when Jesus had spoken to Mary and Joseph when they found him and said, don't you know I must be about my father's business? But then he went home with them and submitted himself to them. And Mary never forgot that. Even though Jesus knew who he was, he didn't use that as grounds to reject their position, their vocation. He understood that God the Father had given him to them and had given them to him and he received them as such. And so Mary remembered that. So I guess she was confident that Jesus wouldn't let her down. However, he handled the situation. And when we petition our Lord, do we petition, do we come to him with that kind of confidence? When you pray, you pray not necessarily knowing what the Lord will do, but confident that because you know that he is good, he will do good. Amen? Now the question is, how do you get that kind of relationship with God where you can have that kind of confidence in him? Well, Paul puts it this way in Romans 10, beginning at verse 14. How then will they call on him of whom they have not believed? How are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? How can they hear without somebody preaching? How can they preach unless they are sent as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So then faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ, amen? See, that's why the gospel is not only for those who don't know Christ. It's also for those of you who do know him. 
When you think you don't need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ because you're too deep for that, yeah, you're probably about to drown in your deepness. But I could go on, but let me return to the text here. Verse five, his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. And there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rite of purification, each holding about 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them to the brim. And then he said, now draw out some and take it to the master of the feast. And so they took it. So the Lord commanded, and the servants filled the six water pots, threw out one vintage of wine, enough wine to satisfy everybody present. You know, I, I, in fact, you, you actually, it was probably beyond all they needed. I did a little calculation with the help of a thing online, bigredliquors.com, a drink calculator. And according to that calculator, there was enough wine there for 1,500 people. Now, Nazareth was not that big of a town. I'm pretty sure if you'd have drawn a circle of 50 miles around Cana, you wouldn't have come up with 1,500 people. And I'm not talking about 1,500, each one getting one glass. That was 1,500 of everybody having at least three or four glasses. So Jesus made more than enough for everything and everybody. They could have stuck some aside and had another wedding the next day. But not only did he create a lot of wine, verse 9 says, when the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know from whence it came, although the servants who had drawn the water knew. The master of the feast said to the bridegroom, Everybody serves the good wine. And when people have drunk and well, then the poor wine. But you've kept the good wine until now. Now think about this. Jesus' wine made everything that they had drunk before poor. It wasn't the way the master of the feast expected it. It wasn't the way the bridegroom planned it. It wasn't the way the friends had set things in order. But when Jesus put his up to the test, all of a sudden, all that good stuff that they thought they had was now poor by comparison. In fact, it wasn't just better wine. The Greek word that translates as good actually means beautiful. It was beautiful wine. It was the wine that is normally designated from the first squeezing of the grapes. That wine when they lay the grapes out on the rock the first time and step on it and push out all that pure grape juice. No dust, no skins, no dirt, just pure juice. And they put that juice in the, in, in the, in the bottle, seal it up, mark it up and says first vintage first pressing, and they set that aside. And then the next day, they go back out to the rock. They look at those grapes that have been stomped on the day before. Then they step on those grapes. They get whatever they can get out of it. They squeeze it out with their heel. They break them skins down. And everything that comes out of it, they just scoop that up and put that in a box. And they mark that as the second squeezing the lesser wine. Yeah, see, they have the better wine and the lesser all stored up nice and separate. And then when they have the wedding, they take out the good. They have enough good to get everybody drunk. Then they take out that other stuff. You know the kind of wine, the kind you don't drink. The kind you would not admit that you ever drank. You know MD 2020, Boone's Farm, TJ Swan, oh, Ripple, yes, Lord, that stuff. The kind that you don't even know what it tastes like, and you might be barely awake when you drink it. But that's what they normally would set out for the second course. But Jesus brings out for the third course the most beautiful wine you ever tasted. Uh, uh, uh. And, and here's the thing now, 
Think about this for a minute. The Bible says that this, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Now who was present at what Jesus called the first of his signs? Now we've got the wedding celebrants, we've got his mother, his disciples, and the servants. The, the celebrants were oblivious to Jesus. His mother knew Jesus. His disciples were learning of Jesus and the servants heard and obeyed Jesus without knowing him even. Each of these groups benefited, but only one group, the Bible says, believed in it as a result. The servants saw what happened, but it was only with their eyes. They didn't see it with their hearts. The, the wedding celebrants enjoyed the beautiful wine. But they didn't know where it came from, nor did they care. But his disciples saw his glory. See, that's why it's not enough to just be in the room when Jesus does his work. That's why it's not just enough to kind of sort of hear what the preacher says when he preaches the gospel. You've got to hear with the heart. The ear might deceive. The mind might befuddle you. But if you open your heart, to let God's word come in. Something will happen on the inside. Hebrews 4, 1 and 2 says, Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us as well as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them, not being united with faith in those who listen. You know, people talk about Jesus being there personal savior, as if he works on saving individuals here and there, and therefore the church is actually just sort of an accident that sort of showed up. But that's not what the Bible says about it. The Bible says believers are always spoken in the context of the unity of the faith, according to Ephesians 4 and 13. And as we confess regarding the third article of the Apostles' Creed, God saves us by the Holy Spirit as we're called and enabled to respond to the gospel by his gracious will, overcoming our individual sinful will. God unites us into one communion through the one gospel of his son by means of one holy baptism. Our unity is expressed as we eat of the one bread and drink of the one cup shared by us by our one host. Amen. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Our unity is expressed both in worship and in witness. It's expressed in the word and in the walk that God, the Holy Spirit, places within us. And so the, God, the word tells us in Colossians 3, verse 12, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also forgive. And above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, into which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Yes, Lord, be thankful. Thankful because Jesus Christ has made us one in his own body, cleansed us from sin with his own blood. Thankful because he takes away not only your sins, but your sin. Thankful that he gives us not the lesser wine of the world, but the beautiful wine, the wine from heaven itself. Thankful that he loves us. Not with a sometime love, but with an everlasting love. Thankful that he gives not a limited amount 
uh, but he gives us an abundant amount of amazing grace. So there's much, so much grace. Uh, we don't have to argue about it. We don't have to compete for it. We don't have to fight one another for a spot at the table. Thank you, Jesus. The Bible says in Psalm 133, behold how good and how pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. Amen. Yes, it's a beautiful thing. It's a godly thing. It's a precious thing to experience the communion of saints. Uh, the world longs for what God gives to us. It wants to see that there is a place where it can go and experience amazing grace. Their eyes tell them it cannot be, but the Lord said, taste and see. We have one faith. We have one Lord. We have one baptism, and that is the Feast of Victory. Oh, we like to sing about it. This is the Feast of Victory of our God. Hallelujah. Oh, we love the Lord who gives us this indescribable gift. The world thinks that they ought to hate the Lord, but they know deep down inside that they need the Lord. But they don't know how to find him. But there's just one way. His name is Jesus. There's just one truth. His name is the Christ. There is but one hope for all. The Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, let the peace of God that passes all understanding. Guard your hearts and minds. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, let all God's people say, Amen. Amen.